Today our topic is debate over the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the two important cities of the Japan. These bombings concern the ethical, legal and military controversies surrounding the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on 6 August and 9 August 1945. at the close of world war second the very circumstances were the soviet union declared war on japan and or before 9 august and invaded manchuria at 1 minutes past midnight japan surrendered on 15 august and on 26 july 1945 united states president harry s truman united kingdom prime minister winston churchill and chairman of the chinese nationalist government chiang kai shek issued the ports dam declaration which outlined the terms of surrender by for the empire of japan as agreed upon at the ports dam conference this ultimatum stated if japan did not surrender it would face prompt and utter destruction some debaters focus on the presidential decision making process and others on whether or not the bombings were the proximate cause of japanese surrender over the course of time different arguments have gained and lost support as new evidence has become available and as new studies have been completed a primary and continuing focus has been on the role of the bombings in japan's surrender and the us justification for them based upon the premises that the bombings precipitated the surrender this remains the subject of both scholarly and popular debate in 2005 in an overview of the historiography about the matter j samuel walker wrote the controversy over the use of the bomb seems certain to continue walker stated the fundamental issue that has divided scholars over a period of nearly four decades is whether the use of the bomb was necessary to achieve victory in the war in the pacific on terms satisfactory to the united states supporters of the bombings generally assert that they caused the japanese surrender preventing massive casualties on both sides in the planned invasion of japan kayoshi was to be invaded in november 1945 and hanshu four months later it was thought japan would not surrender unless there was an overwhelming demonstration of destructive capability those who opposed the bombings argue it was militarily unnecessary inherently immoral a war crime or a form of state terrorism critics believe a naval blockade and conventional bombings would have forced japan to surrender unconditionally some critics believe japan was more motivated to surrender by the soviet union's invasion of manchuria and other japanese held areas if we see in the context of international law at the time of the bombings there was no international treaty or instrument protecting a civilian population specifically from attack by aircraft many critics of the atomic bombings point to the hawk conventions of 1899 and 1907 as setting rules in place regarding the attack of civilian populations the hawk Con- conventions contain no specific air warfare provisions but it prohibited the targeting of undefined civilians by naval artillery field artillery or siege engines all of which were classified as bombardment however the conventions allowed the targeting of military establishment in cities including military depots industrial plants and workshops which could be used for war this set of rules was not followed during world war 1st which saw bombs dropped indiscriminately on cities by zeppelins and multi-engine bombards afterward another series of meetings were held at the hog in 1922 23 but no binding agreement was reached regarding air warfare 
During the 1930s and 1940s, the aerial bombing of cities was resumed, notably by the German Condor Lachian, against the cities of Gorinica and Durango in Spain 1937. During the Spanish Civil War, this led to an escalation of various cities bombed, including Chongqing, Warsaw, Rotterdam, London, Conventry, Hamburg, Dresden, and Tokyo. All of the major belligerents in World War II dropped bombs on civilians in cities. Modern debate over the applicability of the Hawk Conventions to the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki revolves around whether the convention can be assumed to cover modes of warfare that were at the time unknown, whether rules for artillery bombardment can be applied to rules for aerial bombing. As well, the debate hinges on to what degree the Hague Conventions was being followed by the warring countries. If the Hague Conventions are admitted as applicable, the critical question becomes whether the bombed cities met the definition of undefended. Some observers consider Hiroshima and Nagasaki undefended. Some say that both cities were legitimate military targets. Others say that Hiroshima could be considered a legitimate military target while Nagasaki was comparatively undefended. Hiroshima has been argued as not a legitimate target because the major industrial plants were just outside the target area. It has also been argued as a legitimate target because Hiroshima was the headquarters of the regional 2nd General Army and 5th Division, with 40,000 combatants stationed in the city. Both cities were protected by anti-aircraft guns, which is an argument against the definition of undefended. The Hague Conventions prohibited poison weapons. The radioactivity of the atomic bombings has been described as poisonous, especially in the form of the nuclear fallout, which kills more slowly. However, this view was rejected by the International Court of Justice in 1996, which stated that the primary and exclusive use of air burst nuclear weapons is not to poison or SYX8 and thus is not prohibited by the Geneva Protocol. The Hague Conventions also prohibited the employment of arms projectiles or material calculated to cause unnecessary suffering. The Japanese government cited this prohibition on 10 August 1945 after submitting a letter of protest to the United States denouncing the use of atomic bombs. However, the prohibition only applied to weapons as lances with a barbed head, irregularly shaped bullets projectiles filled with glass, the use of any substance on bullets that would tend unnecessarily to inflame a wound inflicted by them, along with grooming bullet tips are the creation of soft point bullets by filling off the ends of the hard coating on full metal jacketed bullets. It, however, did not apply to the use of the explosives contained in artillery projectiles, mines, aerial torpedoes, or hand grenades. In 1962 and in 1963, the Japanese government retracted its previous statement by saying that there was no international law prohibiting the use of atomic bombs. The Hague Convention stated that religious buildings, art and science centers, charities, hospitals, and historic monuments were to be spared as far as possible in a bombardment unless they were being used for military purposes. Critics of the atomic bombings point to many of these kinds of structures which were destroyed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, the Hague Conventions also stated that for the destruction of the enemies properly to be justified, it must be imperatively demanded by the necessities of war. Because of the inaccuracy of heavy bombards in World War II, it was not practical to target military assets in cities without damage to civilian targets. Even after the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan, no international treaty banning or condemning nuclear warfare has ever been ratified. The closest example is a resolution by the UN General Assembly which stated that nuclear warfare was not in keeping with the UN Charter passed in 1953, a vote of 25 to 20 and 26 abstentions may be not noticed. 
the New York Times on 19 August 2020 by Richard J. Samuels, an article is a critical analysis and that is giving us understanding about the debate of nuclear weapons which were used against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Whether these weapons were used to enforce Japan to be surrendered in World War II or there was other objectives. Every August newspaper had dotted with the stories of Hiroshima and Nagasaki accompanied by a well-picked over but never resolved debate over whether atomic bombs were needed to end the Asia-Pacific War on American terms. What is left to learn 75 years and with so much spilled ink later from Mark Galash Galakichio. The answer is in the domestic politics of the United States and Japan, which drive a narrative that onwards less like a debate than a geopolitical thriller. Unconditional offers a fresh perspective on how the decision to insist on unconditional surrender was not simply a choice between pressing the Japanese into submission or negotiating an end to the conflict. It also traces ideological battle lines that remained visible well into the atomic age as the enemy shifted from Tokyo to Moscow. Preston Arias Truman believed unconditional surrender would keep the Soviet Union world while reassuring American voters and soldiers that their sacrifices in a total war would be compensated by total victory. Disarming enemy militaries was the start. Consolidating democracy abroad was the goal. Only by refusing to deal with dictators could Germany and Japan be redesigned route to branch. But Truman faced powerful opposition from the Republican establishment, including the former president Herbert Hoover and Henry Luce, whose time Life Media Empire presaged Fox News. Republicans fought Truman on two fronts. First, they sought to undo New Deal social and economic reforms. Second, they argued that giving Japan a respectable way, way out of the conflict would save lives and the same, at the same time block Soviet ambitions in Asia. Conservatives believed the left in the United States was more determined to use unconditional surrender to destroy Japanese feudalism than to confront Soviet ambitions. Future MENA from even for post-war red batters like Senator Joseph McCarthy said, Galic Chio characterizes conciliatory state department, Japan hands as dupes of cosmopolitan Japanese who persuaded them that Japan's emperor was actually a progressive who would help America build a stable anti-communist East Asia. But New Deal Democrats believed these exports did not know what they did not know about Japan and prefiguring new conservatives of a later era, they insisted that only the deposition of the emperor as part of a full transformation of the country's political culture would usher Japan into a peaceful post-war community of nations. The left-wing journalist I. E. Stone joined the fray. He rallied against reactionaries who he said were determined to stir a red scare to roll back reform in America, purge progressive officials and deliver a conditional unconditional surrender to their friends in Tokyo. Black Chiu, the author of the several books of military history, sorts out these players and many others with great clarity, noting that Truman played coyly with both sides as the war shifted decisively in the Allies' favor. Convinced that the Japanese would not surrender short of a final decisive battle or once the atomic bomb was available, a final incendiary event, Truman was unwilling to suggest American resolve was weakening. He used the Ports Dam Declaration of July to remind the Japanese that only more devastation awaited if they held out. He understood that imperial cooperation would ease the difficult task of disarming 5.5 million Japanese soldiers, and he ultimately spared 
Hirohito, but he would not guarantee the emperor's status before the end of the war. Japan's leaders felt little urgency. The imperial military had amassed an astonishing number of troops for a desperate homeland defense, while politicians fantasized about a Soviet brokered peace. Lacking a guarantee of his safety, the emperor supported the effort to reach out to Moscow and busied himself with protecting sacred relics. Even after the first A bomb incinerated Hiroshima, he asked the government to seek allied concessions, underscoring Galaxio's claim that Japanese officials seemed uncertain of what they were doing. With the Red Army suddenly deep into the Manchuria, Japanese leaders were weighing evaporating options when the second bomb incinerated Nagasaki. What had been Shimri was now clearly delu delusional. The Emperor finally intervened, overruling his generals. He broadcast a decree, Galactios sardonically calls, almost comically, Evasive, because I omitted the words surrender and defeat. While many Japanese were confused and saddened, they accepted the emperor's most famous edict to endure the undurable. Some military officers, Thao, committed suicide after a failed mutiny on what has been become known as Japanese longest day. Galactios deftly recounts how debate about true man's decision persisted well after the surrender. In Japan, aggressive reforms early in the occupation were opposed by the same Western-educated Japanese who had influenced America's Japan hands. These elites were keen on defanging the Japanese military but tried to block land, labor, and electoral change. Unconditional documents, how conservatives back home targeted new dealers within the occupation as communist sympathizers and hashed revisionist histories of two men's motives, exaggerating the emperor's anti-militarism. Their revisionism was replaced by a new left brand in the 1960s. Two men, some now argued, instigated the Cold War by trying to intimidate the Soviet Union with America's nuclear might. In 1995, a half century after the war, the debates were reignited when curators at the Smithsonian Institution tried unsuccessfully to use this account of United States aggression to frame an exhibition in which the Enola guy, the plane that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, was the leading artifact unconditional is a sharp reminder of the power, imperfection and politicization of historical narrative and of the way debates can continue long after history's witnesses have left the stage. But after 70 years Hiroshima, the opinions have shifted on use of atomic pump. On August 6, 1945, United States dropped an atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing tens of thousands of people, many instantly others from the effects of radiation. Death estimates range from 66,000 to 1,50,000. The declining support in both the U.S. and Japan for America's bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The two days analysis as the percentage approval of or think the use of the atomic pumps on Japanese city in 1945 was justified or not justified. The U.S. in 1945, 85% population have approved and in 2005, only the 57. And in the U.S. in 1991, only 63 have supported the atta attacking on Hiroshima and Nagasaki with a bomb. And in 2015, only 56% were remaining to ask it is justified or it was a justified. And in Japan 1991, 
only 29 percent and in 14 2015 can ask it was justified and they proved the attack but it is a survey from the uh, Detroit press in 1991 because the data which has been availed from the Gallup that is the American data and the Pew Research Center has given has maintained the survey so uh, there is nothing any analysis which can be acceptable on behalf of the Japan what the Japanese say that is not on the record at this time this first use of a nuclear weapon by any nation has long divided Americans and Japanese. Americans have consistently approved of this attack and have said it was justified. The Japanese have not. But opinions are changing. Americans are less and less supportive of their use of atomic weapons and the Japanese are more and more opposed. In 1945, a Gallup poll immediately after the bombing found that 85% of Americans approved of using the new atomic weapon on Japanese cities in 1991, according to the Detroit Free Press survey conducted in both Japan and the U.S. 63% of Americans said the atomic bomb attacks on Japan were a justified means of ending the war, while only 29% thought the action was unjustified. At the same time, on 29% Japanese said the bombing war was justified, while 64% thought it was unwarranted. How Japanese can say it was justified? But a 2015 Pew Research Center survey finds that the share of Americans who believe the use of nuclear weapons was justified is now 56%, with 34% saying it was not. In Japan, only 14% say the bombing was justified, versus 79% who say it was not. Not surprisingly, there is a large generation gap among Americans in attitudes toward the bombings of Hiroshima. Seven in ten Americans ages 65 and older say the use of the atomic weapons was justified. But only 47% of 18 to 29 year old Zachary, there is a similar partisan divide. 74% are Republicans, but only 52% Democrats see the use of nuclear weapons at the end of World War II as warranted. In the years since World War II, two issues have fueled a debate over America's use of nuclear weapons against Japan. Did Washington have an alternative to the course it pursued, the bombing of Hiroshima, followed by dropping a second atomic weapon on Nagasaki on August 9? And should the U.S. now apologize for these actions? The 70 years ago, most Americans said, they would have used atomic pump if why they have used atomic pump so the wiped out cities 23 percent and refused four percent to use any of the opinion bombed where there was no people bombed one city at a time so the 44 percent say the America should bomb only on one city, but 26% say the bomb must have to be used where there were no people. The Pew Research Center in 1945, National Opinion Research Center on September, the source of this data. In September 1945, the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago asked Americans what they would have done if they had been the one to decide whether or not to use the atomic bomb against Japan. At the time, a plurality of Americans supported the course chosen by the Truman administration. Only 44% said they would have bombed one city at a time, and another 23% would have wiped out cities in general. In other words, two-thirds would have bombed some urban area. Just 26% would have dropped the bomb on locations that had no people. And In 
In September 1945, the National Opinion Research Center at the University of the Chicago asked Americans what they had done if they had been the only one to decide whether or not to use the atomic bomb against Japan. At the time, plurality of Americans supported the course chosen by the Truman administration. 44% said they would have bombed one city at a time, and another 23% would have wiped out cities in general. In other words, two-thirds would have bombed some urban area. Just 26% would have dropped the bomb on location that had no people and only 4% would not have used the bomb. By 1995, 50 years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, support for an alternative to the bombing had grown. Caleb asked Americans whether had the decision been left up to them. They would have ordered the bombs to be dropped or tried some other way to force the Japanese to surrender. Half the respondents said they would have tried some other way while 44% still backs using nuclear weapons. But this decline in American support for the use of atomic bombs against Japanese cities did not mean Americans thought they had to apologize for having done so. In that same Gallup survey, 73% said the U.S. should not formally apologize to Japan for the atomic bomb attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Only 20% supported an official apology. The question on the justification of the U.S. dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki during the Second World War. For years, debate have raged over whether the U.S. was right to drop two atomic bombs on Japan during the final weeks of the Second World War. The first bomb dropped on the city Hiroshima, second on the Nagasaki. The second which hit was also a deliberate attack on the Japanese city where 50,000 people were killed. But was the U.S. justified or not justified? We put the question to historians and to history extra readers. America's use of atomic bomb to attack the Japanese city has long remained one of the most controversial decisions of the Second World War. Here a group of historians views and whether the U.S. President Truman was right or not right to authorize to attack with nuclear weapon. Truman had little choice. Otani Boye, Buor. Few actions in war are morally justifiable. All a commander or protocol leader can hope to assess is whether a particular course of action is likely to reduce the loss of life. Faced with Japanese refusal to surrender, President Truman had little choice. His decision was mainly based on the estimate of half a million Allied casualties likely to be caused by invading the home islands of Japan. There was also the likely death rate from starvation for Allied prisoner of war and civilians as the war dragged on well into the 1946. What Truman did n not know and which has only been established quite recently is that the Imperial Japanese Army could never contemplate surrender, having forced all their men to fight to the death since the start of the war. Our civilians were to be mobilized and forced to fight with bamboo, spears and satchel charges to act as suicide bombards against Allied run tanks. Japanese documents apparently indicate their army was prepared to accept up to 28 million civilian deaths. What was the science behind the bombings on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Autonomy Bivor is a best-selling military historian specializing in the Second World War. His most recent book is Ardennes 1944, Hitler's Last Gamble. No, it was immoral and unnecessary. The dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima was not justified at the time as being moral in order to bring about a more rapid victory and prevent the deaths of more Americans. However, it was clearly not moral to use this weapon, knowing that it would kill civilians and destroy the urban milieu, and it was not necessary either. Military Japan was finished as the Soviet invasion of Manchuria that August showed. 
further blockade and urban destruction would have produced a surrender in August or September at the latest, without the need for the costly anticipated invasion of the atomic bomb. As for the second bomb on the Nagasaki, that was just as necessary or unnecessary as the first one. It was deemed to be needed, partly because it was different design and the military and many civilian scientists were keen to see if both worked the same way. There was, in other words, a cynical scientific imperative at work as well. If we see the destructive pictures in which the horrific scene any one can visualize if one goes to Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and can observe the devastation and the circumference of the destruction Richard Ori is a professor of history at the University of the Exeter he recently wrote to the Oxford Illustrated History of the World War II yes it was the least bad option Robert James Maddox say the atomic bombs were horrible but I agree with US Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson that using them was the least abhorrent choice. A bloody invasion and round-the-clock conventional bombing would have led to a far higher death toll, and so the atomic weapons actually saved thousands of Americans and millions of Japanese lives. The bombs were the best means to bring about unconditional surrender, which is what the U.S. leaders wanted. Only this would enable the Allies to occupy Japan and root out the institutions that led to war in the first place. To count down to Hiroshima, the experience with Germany after the First World War had persuaded them that a mere armistice would constitute a betrayal of future generations if an even larger war occurred 20 years or down the line. It is true that the radiation effects of the atomic bomb provided a grisly dividend, which the U.S. leaders did not anticipate. However, even if they had known, I don't think it would have changed their decision. Robert James Maddox is author of the Hiroshima. No Japan would have surrendered anywhere, Martin J. Sherwin says. I believe it was a mistake and a tragedy that the atomic bombs were used. Those bombings had little to do with the Japanese decision to surrender. The evidence has become overwhelming that it was the entry of the Soviet Union on 8 August into the war against Japan that forced surrender. But un understandably, these views were difficult for Americans to accept. Of the Japanese leader, it was the military ones who held out against the civilian leaders who were closest to the emperor and who wanted to surrender provided the emperor's safety would be guaranteed. The military's argument was that Japan could convince the Soviet Union to mediate on its behalf for better surrender terms than unconditional surrender and therefore should continue the war until that was achieved. How and when did the Second World War and